Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Caribbean Cultural Center, African Diaspora Institute, I'm very pleased to be with all of you. Uh, my name is Marinio Esalva. I'm a program consultant for the Sacred Traditions uh, program. And this evening, we have the great privilege of speaking with a multi-generational panel of elders who are going to be exploring African spirituality embodied. Um, we're going to be speaking about the Yoruba and the Congo religious systems and specifically the ways in which we use our bodies to pray. Um, as we know, our traditions, whether we're talking about Candomblé in Brazil, Vodun in Haiti, uh, Ixeche, Lukumi, Ocha, Palo Mayombe, um, or any of the Palo traditions, and most indigenous traditions around the world, actually, right? Whether they are African in origin or from other indigenous communities, how we use our bodies, particularly through sung prayer through dance um, and other forms of embodied worship is the way that we essentially communicate with the divine realm, right? With the sacred realm. Um, and increasingly as our people migrate to Western societies, right? The United States, Europe, and other parts of the world where this isn't necessarily the standard tradition, we see these traditions have to confront a range of complexities, right? <clears throat> as the traditions are in some cases become, you know, traditions for consumption, they're commodified, they're bought and sold, they're taught, right, um, through formal education and educational spaces. And so there are many sort of um, nuances and, and, you know, complex kind of um, texture to how we navigate the realm and the domain of the sacred and the profane or the secular. And so we have the great privilege this evening of speaking with a multi-generational panel of elder Afwons, dancers, um, Oluvata, right? Uh, drummers, sacred drummers, and also artists, scholars in our community who are practitioners of, of our faith, of our African faith. We have a range of practitioners, again, primarily from the Lokumi, Isheshe, and um, Balo traditions. And so I want to bring them on the screen so that we can sort of dig in and, and as a community start to have a, a conversation and some reflection around what it means to, to, you know, to transmit these practices, to preserve these practices, um, to embody these practices and also to honor these practices and traditions which are passed down to us from our elders and eventually become our responsibility to transmit um, to the next generation. So with that, I'd like to begin with Iyama McKen, who I would like brought to the screen, who is joining us from New York City, um, priestess, elder priestess of Yemaya. Um, initiated in 1979, Afwong artisan because she's, she she sews, she makes, she's a, a textile artist, um, and one of our very honored and revered community elders um, who has the gift of song. And so thank you, Ia Ama, for being with us. Thank you, thank you for having me. I'd like to bring uh, to the to the stage, it's like this is a virtual space, it's a stage, it's a room, right? It's a global community that we're entering into virtually Baba Neil Clark, Chief Baba Neil Clark, um, Oluwo, Chief Baba Neil Clark, Priest of Oshun, um, Sacred Drummer, um, I would say purveyor and keeper of wisdom and knowledge of all do of tradition, both song and, you know, through song and the spoken word, um, a teacher in our community. So welcome, Chief Baba Neil. Hey, Kale. good evening, everyone. And representing the eastern side of Cuba, I want to welcome Dani Perez Prades La Mora, a dancer, priest also. We have lots of water on this call, the priest of Yemaya and Ochun. Um, I think I'm, I'm bringing the earth and sky element, bringing Obatala to some balance. But I want to welcome you, Dani. Thank you for being with us. Um, Danny, yes, Danny, thank you for being with us. You were muted, so thank you so much again. Thank you, thank you to you and everyone. And I want to welcome my sister, artist, scholar, dancer, Jesenia Celier, also from Cuba, um, practitioner. Uh, you know, she's a student of our traditions, right? A student and a researcher, and also a keeper of, of sort of the wisdom that lives at the intersections of practice and creativity. Right, so thank you, Yesenia, joining us from New Jersey. You're, you're, you're with us, thank you, Yesenia. So let's get into this conversation. What I'd like to sort of orient our audience is, I'd like you all to begin 
um, in order of presentation, if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, people who are not in any of the African religious traditional systems don't necessarily have an understanding of how these traditions of song and dance and prayer um, are transmitted. We know that so many of our traditions are transmitted orally. Um, it wasn't until 1961 when the University of Ileife, Nigeria was founded that many of the text, sacred um, scripture of the Odu of Ifa began to be written. Even though there had been some publication prior, we start to see the largest body of Ifa text coming out of the University of Ileife in 1961. Um, and historically, for all of the reasons that we know due to enslavement in the Americas and the traditions of mutual aid and maroon societies that preserved our culture, much of our culture was transmitted orally. Um, but each of you is a sort of a master, a master teacher, a master practitioner of, you know, a sacred artistic form that is not only transmitted orally, but through the body. So I'd like you, I'd, and through voice, right? If you're, if you're Iya Ama. So I'd like each of you to sort of um, start us off by telling us, you know, your years of initiation. Um, I mentioned some of that, but tell us, you know, sort of where you come from, what your lineage is, both religiously and also artistically. Love to hear about your lineage as artists, um, who were the who were the people that taught you, um, and then and then passed on right the responsibility of of both serving our community through through these sacred arts, but also um, teaching it to others. So we could begin there. Okay. Yeah, Ama. Alrighty. Well, um, my name Ama uh, Dawn McKen, given name Ama Saturday name Ghanaian. Omiale is my um, my initiate, initiated name, um, a Yemanja priest of 41 years, um, initiated by um, Ascension Serrano Osonko, a Puerto Rican, here um, in New York City in Brooklyn. I was uh, ordained at that time and by that person. I uh, have been a practitioner of this tradition um, for 50 years. I uh, was introduced to a dance class um, in this neighborhood where I am residing now. Um, the instructor was uh, Chief Hofonde, uh, mm -hmm. who was a Shango priest, Ivai Ivai Tonu, he has passed on. Uh, at that very class, I uh, was asked to um, attend a bembe. Um, and from that point on, um, that was the, my calling. Uh, my, chief, my teachers were Chief Bay, um, Olu Kobe, Lawrence Tweet. Um, he was an Apom. Um, Olukushe Wiles, uh, Ishandi Rizak, Makita Rizak, Russell Burroughs, uh, Orlando Puntilla Rios, uh, Pedrito Martinez, Roman Diaz, Neil Clark, um, and my supporting, my supporting group um, who I learned from as well, um, Ola Denise DeJean, Larry Washington, and those are just to name a few. I, I just like to include everyone, you know, that I have um, I have worked with and studied with, because um, learning is very vast, and it's something that you can always learn and receive from from someone. So um, I. Um, I was asked to attend this Dembe, and, and at that very point, I was 15 years old. Um, the ensemble was uh, Abericola, um, Bata drums that were played, and the it was very invigorating and very magnetic. Hmm. I was pulled into a vortex of energy and spirit. And with gratitude, I accepted 
and and that began my journey. Um, and from that point on, um, here I am um, continuing the the legacy of those shoulders who on which I stand of our poems, um, some of those that I've mentioned, and um, drummers as well, dancers, and all of what encapsulates um, projecting the tradition and the culture of the Yoruba tradition. Thank you so much, Yama. I really appreciate that you're uplifting the sort of the interdependence, right, of all of these roles and the way that we learn together. Um, and also the intergenerational um, sort of fabric that also holds us together. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that story. I think our oral histories are, are very, very important um, to, to preservation, right, in our, in our present context. Baba Neil. Oh, uh, where do we start? Um, my name is Chief Baba Adewede Ayanlere Toko De. Neil Clark. Adewere is my, uh, the name that I received when I was initiated to Oshun. Uh, that was uh, about 34 years ago. That was 34 years ago, 1987. Um, uh, Ayan Leti is the name that I received when I was initiated to Ayan in, uh, in Oyo, Nigeria. That was in 1994, so that was about 27 years ago. Uh, Toko Day is the name that I received when I was initiated to Ifa, and uh, that was actually 11 years ago. That was in uh, 20, 2010. Uh, and uh, my chieftaincy title is Alufo Pejo Awo of Oshobo. And it's the title that I received when I was in, installed as a chief in Oshobo in, uh, that was uh, 2016. So that was five years ago. Um, I actually started drumming about 50 years ago. Um, and it was really, well, it was ordained actually. It was ordained. Um, as a young person, um, you know, a lot of people that know me know the story that I lost my dad when I was uh, nine and a half. And I, I actually went into a tailspin uh, in response to that. And in the community's effort to assist me, um, one of the elders in the community who was neither a practitioner uh, nor an initiate uh, offered to tutor me in in uh, math and English so that I could take the test for Brooklyn Tech. And after he tutored me, after our tutoring sessions on Sunday afternoon, he would give me something to drink and give me lunch. And while I was having my lunch, he would play Mongo Santa Maria, Afro-Cuban rhythms and chants. And he would play all the Tunji's uh, drums of passion. And that was the beginning of my introduction uh, to the Orisha tradition and to actually to Africa in any shape or form. And as I said, he was, a, he was an elder. He was a doctor in the community a general practitioner community. Turns out years later, he had been to Africa many times. He had been to Cuba many times. And he, he introduced me to the culture and, and the spiritual traditions of Orisha. Uh, I went on to continue playing and I learned how to play in the streets of Brooklyn and Central Park, in Orchard Beach, in Reese Beach. And as I learned how to play, I became interested in the rhythms that we were playing and the songs that we were singing. So one day I inquired to someone if I could get a reading. 
and they directed me to Osaunko. So I went to get a reading and she put a leckies on me. That was about 1973, 73, 74. And then I began to meet Aluka Shea, Baba Yomi, and Milton Cardona, and all of these people who were her godchildren. And, uh, and then I began playing for ceremonies. And, um, and then I realized that I needed to get a teacher. So I approached Chief Bay, and I approached uh, Baba Shangi, and they became not only my teachers, but my mentors and my masters, because I apprenticed with them, Chief Bay, I apprenticed with him for 30 years. Baba Shangi, just about as long. And then, and, and Baba Lukashe, I apprenticed with him. And when I say I apprenticed with them, I didn't just go and play drums. I went and worked in, in Chief Bay's house. And I went and worked in Bobby Shangi's house. And Baba Lukashe took me and I worked with him on construction sites because hmm. uh, he was a contractor. So those are relationships that developed that went way beyond just learning how to play music and 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 dancing and and venerating the Orisha. They became relationships that uh that informed me on how to pursue my life. Thank you. And I think, you know, we're very aware at the center that our audience is very diverse, right? So we have many, many practitioners and initiates in our audience. We also have many students and many people who are searching and sort of learning about the religion, particularly through the arts, right? Who are introduced to African traditions through dance, through song, et cetera. And so your story is, you know, it highlights some of, I think, the universal threads that a lot of folks have in terms of what their initial contact with Orisha is, right? It's often through the arts that people enter. It's or a song in popular culture, a reference in popular culture. Um, so I deeply appreciate that. And I also appreciate, you know, the sort of, the fact that you highlight the importance of building relationships, right? And relationships that are rooted in religion, but also just rooted in our shared humanity. Um, we practice these, these ancient traditions um, in capitalism, in the context of capitalism, where, you know, lots of relationships are based on transactions and you sort of you pay for something and you get something. Um, and we know, right, as practitioners and practitioners come from lineages of respected elders, that the way that we preserve, protect, and transmit these traditions is actually by doing the opposite, right? It's by building strong foundations um, an opportunity for personal transformation even that goes beyond a transaction. So thank you for uplifting that thread about sort of how community is built and how relationships are built. Um, I think that's a really essential kind of ethical piece in terms of how and, and how we practice, right? Our, our worldview as well as practitioners. Well, I see, um, what, yeah, I just want to say that, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the statement of it takes a village to raise a child. I am that child that was raised by the village. You know, people may see me today as an elder, but the reason, one of the reasons that I feel as strongly as I do about the cultural element is because I am that child that was raised by the community when I went through the trauma of losing my father, it was the community that, that stepped up and made sure that I didn't fall between the cracks because I could very easily have been a statistic. Thank you, Baba. Um, Danny, so you're coming to us from the other side of the ocean, the beautiful sea, right? from Santiago de Cuba. Um, talk to us a little bit about your story. Well, when you have a, um, so many road walking, it's hard to start to thinking when you make this question, how you can start, you know, when you can start. But I miss you a bit younger. <laughs> so my name is Danis Perez Prades. My artistic name is La Mora. My name as a Ija is Omilari. That is my name. I'm Omoyemaya. I have a 
38 years consecrated in Regla Conga or Palo, 23 years consecrated on Regla de Ocha, and 22 years as um, APTB COFA, 22 years. Uh, if we're talking about the age, I would like to mention this as well, uh, how many years I have it on my artistic uh, life that is 39 years already on the road, dancing, working and preserve and defend my black art. I want to explain you a little bit more about my um, family where I'm coming from. My parents were not practitioners, but they was a, a people for a great faith. My grandma used to have a her altar with La Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre. And in a little bit corner, a booth of Babaluaye or San Lazaro. And for me at this time, I don't understand why all the way behind the door, she had a big stone, a rock. <laughs> and my understanding was she wanted to prevent that the door don't open too much. <laughs> Later on, I know that was an amulet, what we name Elegua, made by stone, then she take care very, very, very stronger. Being an Afro-Cuban, you know, it's impossible not be connected with um, the celebration starting that September, you know, when those tambores and the bembe and start to, to, to play in. And at the middle of the October and then November, when you're thinking everything mm -hmm. is done, it's like December coming even stronger and wider with the celebration of Santa Barbara and we know and the syncretization is Shango, then Babalu Aye, you know, and, and I tell you something, since those bembe and those musicians play this drum, I'm dancing. <laughs> they don't stop, neither I. I never stop until they stop. That's what the first time or the first memory I have that I face my religion and the art that I represent. I'm an Afro-Cuban woman. I'm a folkloric dancer, professor and choreographer, and I'm a religion. Yes, I am. And that's saying shortly, you know, that the deep experience that I have, I don't want it to leave without mentioning my elder. I'm coming for a family, we used to say Rama, that is from Havana, my godmother and my Ajibona can come for Havana. And they coming for a family, they name if we share what it can do, they say this drama is a little bit, have a little bit variation because you can find also a Malake, you know, you can find a leader like Nya Rosalinda, Belen Gonzalez, Ibae, you know, all those kind of people. My madrina, and she's still alive, King Kamachi, her, her name is Atinomi Omoye Maya. My Ayubona Khan is Akutio Shun. My abuelo is, you know, the name is Tinubi. My abuela, you know, Ubatola, you know, I have a leader in order that really uh, represent and, and help me with my practitioners, you know, as a Reinaldo, you know, Omo Elegua, Echueleri, Osvaldo Sala, Omo Chango, Obai Koso, and there's so many people that I cannot stop to, to mention. But as I always say, my, my, my daughter and my son, I say, the word starts for one. So, you know, I'm coming down everybody in this family of the religion. You know, I'm a religion for everybody because war is that for one. And I feel very proud to be here today with all of you and the elders here. Thanks. Thank you, Danis. And Danis is the director of OU Oru Dance Ensemble, and she's also an instructor at Alvin Ailey Dance Extension. I think that's really important because you're both a practitioner that's deeply rooted, but also a teacher and, and someone who carries our tradition out to the world in a very big way. Um, so we want to honor your professional work as well as a dancer, as a choreographer, um, and as a master teacher. Thank you, Dani. Thank you. That's a us. beautiful story. <laughs> and Jesenia Celier. I met Jesenia in the world of hip hop in another life. Um, but Jesenia Celier, um, daughter of Oya, right, Jesenia? Um, artist, scholar, researcher, you know, um, she's not in Habanera. Yo voy a decir Habanera, pero tú no eres Habanera. Tú eres cubana, pero no Habanera. That's right. 
um, Afro-Cuban. Um, pinareña, pinareña. Yo sé que tú eres pinareña. I was going to go there. I don't know if all you know where Pinar de Rio is, pero I, I almost made the grave mistake of saying Habanera, pero no, ya pinareña. Um, and, and, you know, and she's, she's a colleague and she's another artist, scholar, researcher, as I said, who's who's really like taken on, I think, one of the, the most, I think, um, salient and important elements of Jesenia's work is not only the preservation and transmission of these cultures, but also her emphasis and work around gender and femininity and feminine power and the, the divine feminine. Um, so I think that that, among many other things, is, is a perspective that Jesenia is going to bring to this, this discussion. So welcome, Jesenia. Oh my God, thank you, Mari. Uh, I am incredibly honored to be uh, included in this panel, uh, especially uh, with the two people I respect and, and been following for so long, like Ama and La Mora. Uh, I, I have the opportunity to work with Ama in probably like what I call the peak of my life now, or <laughs> dancing with the gods. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with uh, Winter Marsalis, Chucho Valdez, and Pedrito Martinez. Uh, this is something that I, I felt like I could retire after that. Uh, <laughs> and then La Mora, uh, oh my God, uh, I think uh, not only from, uh, from her previous work before coming to the United States, but certainly I think the work of Oyoro is uh, something that uh, tra will transcend uh, the, 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 the moment that we are living right now, because uh, certainly this is like the, the best, uh, better conform and more solid, um, you know, dance company that Afro-Cuban people and Afro-Cuban arts have been able to have in the United States. And, and we know, you know, how complicated it is to uh, develop uh, a, a company to keep together a company for so long as she's been doing. And I am, I have the pleasure always to take my family, if it's possible, to every single one of her performances because it's, it's almost impossible for other artists to do their work in the quality that La Mora does. And, and definitely, I want you to talk about Siete Mares. You know, I want, I want, I will ask you about Siete Mares eventually, but now let me finish my presentation and I will try to be brief. <laughs> uh, yes, I am from Pinar del Rio. Uh, my parents, uh, all my family is from Pinar del Rio, but I was born and raised in Havana. Uh, I have to say that I am not, uh, I don't have an initiation as most people in this panel. Uh, but I do, I am at a Peter B of, of, I have my COFA for 22 years. I have the privilege to receive my COFA in the uh, Ifairan Lowell uh, House Temple in Havana. That is probably uh, the, the, the group that has a strongest commitment about education, about uh, the, the dialogue, you know, with these different disciplines. Uh, not only uh, with other religious uh, branches, kind of an ecumenic approach to the religion, but also uh, in my house temple is a place in that you will always see people from different bodies of knowledge, anthropologists, historians. Uh, it's, it's an open place for anybody that is interested in the knowledge of our religion. Um, and I do believe the work of my godfather uh, that has been my 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 mentor you know into the religious knowledge uh certainly is not only in the field of the of the religious you know production or or you know uh, scholarship he has written like more than seven books about if i la santeria but i do uh think now that i am more into the scholarship well I do believe his work is pretty much an anti-colonial type of work or a decolonial type of work or a post-colonial type of work mm -hmm. because uh, one of the first ideas that he taught me when I entered the temple is like, we've been practicing this religion for 200 years as a slaves and as a prosecuted people, but we are not slaves anymore. So we need to take our practice into another level. We need to take this practice into the uh, into the into the global realm, you know, and we don't have to hide anymore. 
to be practitioners of this religion in any feel or any way that we decide to take on this practice. So uh, certainly has been a very important role model, not only in terms of religion, but also in terms of my thinking. Uh, thanks to him, he pushed me into uh, uh, this research a little bit about the, the history of my family. Uh, my family uh, actually have a long lineage of, of healers and mediums. Uh, but this uh, continuity was uh, this uh, was this was stopped uh, because of the Cuban Revolution and the attitude that Cuban Revolution from the very beginning has against the any type of religion, not only the African religions. No, uh, so there was a so I would say that growing up, I did not saw anybody practicing uh, like in my family. But uh, I very recently discovered that actually my grand grandfather was the guardian of uh, the um, Lukumi um, uh, relics and, and all the fundamentals, you know, of a whole, uh, you know, sugar plantation in in Rio. Uh, and he also consecrated all other sacred spaces for the family. So it's it's, a, it's a still is a research that is on, but. Uh, I have been, you know, privileged also to be pushed through my mentor, you know, to discover, you know, because there is really not that much known about how this tradition has uh, survived in the rural areas. We have a lot of knowledge about how this tradition survived in urban areas, in cities, you know, but uh, actually the way that the, this uh, tradition was preserved in rural areas was pretty much through women, through mm -hmm. isolated practitioners, you know, and this is kind of uh, what I've been looking for. So certainly, yes, I have been, uh, I entered pretty much to the, to, the, to the practices through the arts, through dance, through, through theater, pretty much uh, in my teenage years. Uh, but uh, I, then I have the opportunity to get into the If I Don't Lowo and then uh, through my papa, it was, uh, um, you know, we find out that I was, I have the ability to be a, a counselor, you know, for my godfather. So I became the editor of his work. And then through that, I really have the opportunity to go deeper into the philosophy of Ifa, pretty much. And after coming to the United States, I've been pretty much uh, teaching and dancing. But what I define as my artistic work is not the, represent, the more traditional representation that most people have is familiar to see, uh, but pretty much uh, the work I've been, the conceptual type of work and the public interventions I have been doing after 2013 from um, my play Women Orichas On. And this uh, is a kind of a very experimental type of work, but I take the Orichas into public spaces into kind of uh, bringing a, a, a conversation or an actualization of all the political problems about the black body, about the uh, the political, uh, the, I don't know, we are in a, in a, in a state of violence that being experiencing in our communities. And this is, has been one of the main concerns of the work that I've been doing. So I'm gonna finish here because I am way more interested in the conversation and the things that you guys have to say. Thank you so much. Absolutely. There's so much rich, I mean, so many seeds that you just planted. I want to I wanna say hello, Alafia. You have many, many um, greetings in the chat. So we just want to acknowledge our virtual audience, you know, blessings for everyone, minorities, mayores, right? Minors and elders, people of all, of all walks of life and of all faiths that are joining us. Thank you for being with us this evening. Um, Yesenia, you know, I think you raised some really important and interesting questions that we're going to actually get into in this discussion, which is like, you know, you touched on the, the theme of sort of like, what does our tradition look like? And particularly these sacred artistic practices, what do they look like in the context of globalization? What do they look like in the context of a digital world, right? Where the transmission of information is much quicker and is not necessarily through individual relationships and through individual lineages. Um, I think that's really important. And you also said something really interesting about your personal history, which I think I wanna, I wanna honor as well, which is you talked about people in your family as mediums, 
which is another form of embodied African spirituality, right? Espiritismo. We're going to actually have a whole panel in September. So if you're in the audience, please come back in September, September 9th on mediumship, right? And so Espiritismo as an Africanized European practice, right? That is very, very much a, a vessel for embodied African spirituality. And so I want to honor that. Um, Yesenia, thank you for sharing that with us. I think so. So, you know, when we, you know, I think y'all have talked a lot about lineage. You've talked a lot about your experience as students of these traditions and a little bit about your experience as teachers of these traditions. I want to take us so a step even further back and talk about what is the purpose of these traditions, right? For people that are not in any of the African traditional religious faiths, um, you know, we know as, as some of you that their introduction is through the arts, it's through a dance class, it's through a song. Um, but, but these traditions actually have a, a sacred purpose, right? And so, you know, I open the panel to any of you to talk about what is the purpose of these embodied practices, right? What does it mean for our bodies to be vessels of the orishas, of the inquisis, of the loas, of spirits, right? Um, and then what is the responsibility that is attached to that? Well, in my in my in my house, my mommy always told me, "Elder first, I can talk, but I, I want to know if the Iya and the chief want to start open this conversation. I would like to wait for them." <laughs> Ashe, Ashe, you can uh, go. Bob and Neil, I defer to you. Okay, I'm going to jump in, um, and we talk about these are Afrocentric or Afro-oriented Afro or Afro, uh, in, African inspired, African inspired. Uh, so what we're getting to in these various traditions, whether it's uh, Orisha tradition, Yoruba tradition, whether it's Congo tradition, it's essential for us to recognize that they began in Africa. And they began with people who were not slaves. So we must, as we have this ongoing conversation, the conversation begins with the fact that African people did not start as slaves. They started as autonomous, independent, self-reliant civilizations. I mean, the entire human race began in Africa. So. What we're talking about is the way African people perceive the universe, the way African people perceive existence. And everything that is done in any practice began with the initial revelation of the divine, of almighty God, Ola Dumare, uh, Nzambi, whatever language, because language is basically universal and it's unique to locations and people, but however man perceived the first revelation by the divine and everything that's done, whether it's a song, whether it's a dance, whether it's an offering, whether it's a posture, whether it's a relationship, began with that initial revelation. And then depending on where one is, whether it's in Yoruba land, whether it's in Congo, whether it's in Australia with the Aboriginal people, whether it's in Japan, whether it's with the Native Americans in North America, is how did man decide to interact, was directed, was led, was inspired to interact with the divine as it manifests through his immediate environment. The earth, the water, the wind, the trees, the, the storms. So everything that we do, and, and there's a universality of it depending on where we are. So I think it's important for the conversation to start there in that 
we're talking about the way African people have perceived universe, have perceived existence, and then have handed those realizations and those recognitions down that we now know as traditions. For those people who are not necessarily involved with a spiritual tradition, there's a group called the Dogon in Africa. And the Dogon have been documented to have been able to see bodies in space that doc that that western technology did not even realize was there until centuries later so african people have a particular perspective on existence and we can go into how that breaks down to to rhythm rhythm of the drums rhythm of light rhythm of dance, rhythm of song, rhythm of atomic structure. African people have a particular perspective on that, that these traditions are particularly expressive of and reflective of. I'll stop there because I'm sure my colleagues have very much more to take from, from where I started. <laughs> Danny, I believe you wanted to share. Okay, okay, I would like to talk something. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, so let me try. Let me try my best in English. You asking about the responsibility for all those courses that we are talking today, and also not only about the the culture as a religion, but also as a, the culture itself. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, to bring into the human being. And I start thinking, and I telling you, the concept is too wide. It's too wide the responsibility, but um, I need to say I'm a very revolutionary artist in the position to defend <laughs> my art, <laughs> the position to defend the black woman, and the position to defend you know the Afro-Cuban folklore and the diaspora. Um, the artists that I like, uh, I'm fight you know to have a, a space and any kind of platform you know, inside of the artistic projection in any part of our life. And I'm thinking about race. And I say before, I don't know when, was a human race. But then the political coming and divide. Then the religion coming and separate. Then the power coming and categorize. categorize? You can help me with the English. Categorize because the power. And then the human, be the human being race, you know, disappear. Yesenia talking about something about we cannot continue working as a slave because we need to really make a better position. But I remember before those people cross the Atlantic to be a slave, then coming for a kingdom. There was king, queen, and all of the kind of royalty in Abolengo. So talking about responsibility, and that's the thing, and that's my point of view personally, you know, than I working as a religion and as an artist. Because even when everything happens in their own space, at some point we put it together. You know, we put it together because it's science, we put it together because it's humanity. We put it together because it's respect. You know, we could put it together because they're coming to defend the, co the, the, the community. So it's a strong responsibility try to maintain whatever we receive for our ancestors whatever we have inside of our culture. Yeah. Of course, it's a strong responsibility, even on the platform of artistically or on the religion. We need to preserve to the maintain, maintain because without the root, we cannot continue surviving. We need to maintain the root. Root at see. the beginning, root at I the see. beginning for I everything see. that we have said. And I'm talking right now as a human being with our colors. You know, coming from every kind of thing. Ruth, Ruth, la raiz, is the name of everything that we really need to conserve. That's something that I always say. If we dilute, if we lose our religion, our movement, our song, the tradition, we don't have nothing. We are an empty, I'm empty, you know, person that we really need to, to, to preserve here. 
I do have a responsibility with my religion to maintain my religion and the platform that need to be maintained my religion. I have a responsibility with my hard work to maintain on the platform that have to be maintained work. And my responsibility is also to help the behavior for the new uh, generation. Because new generation must to know. I know every generation have their own revolution, but we really need to take care, you know, the behavior of our of this generation. And as a religion, we are the leader to conduct for that way. Because the religion, uh, the religion gave us the value, you know, the value that we really know. Because that is the the lecture of the of the any spirit coming. That's the nation for the egum. That's the nation for Ocha or Lodumare and whatever name of the God in any religion. So we really need to 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 we have the responsibility to carry on this culture. I'm sorry, I feel emotional. That's we need to carry on this culture because that is that is our responsibility and that's, that's, our, that's everything that we ask. We need to carry on with that one to pass and pass in the very good condition. And we know every revolution, every generation have their own revolution. There's many things that cannot be changed and that is our responsibility. I would Thank like you. to jump in. Yeah, I was about to say, eat your armor. <laughs> yes, yeah, what got me moving, you know. Um, Again, and I feel as though I was a revolutionary in, um, in a way, um, let's say, I was divinely guided to go to Africa at the age of 16. And that was through hearing the drum at the age of 15, I decided that I was gonna save, get a job at that age, save my money specifically to buy a ticket to go to Africa the following year. And that the spirit pulled me there. And I feel as though from at that point, when I accepted the responsibility, I made a move to make sure I was gonna be a part of that. So I went to Africa at the age of 16. And people were like, how did you do that? How did your parents let you do that? <laughs> I think that, yeah. But you know what it was they saw? They saw that I was um, true to what it was I was after. And they knew they could see it and feel it and know the source. Um, Chief Bay used to come to my house and and pick me up and take me to the Bimbe's. I was too young to, to go myself. Uh, he met my parents. My parents felt um, secure. They felt as though he would be responsible for me. And I went and I just continued. Um, and 50 years now in the making, I, I still continue to teach and COVID came Okay, no bembe, no classes in person. I started a virtual class. Mm -hmm. um, July will make a year. There is, it's my responsibility to, to do this. I, I feel everything within is within divine order in that where I am and where I am located that class was in walking distance. I was supposed to be at that class. I was supposed to have, you know, I was supposed to have met um, Chief Bay and 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 uh, all of those names that I mentioned: Aluka Shea Wiles and Shangi Vizak and Akita Vizak and Neil Clark and Russell Burroughs. And I was supposed to divinely meet these people and to continue on this path. I believe, you know, we were all born um, with a purpose. We decide in the heavens what it is we are going to do before we get here. And if you are in tune and if you listen, it comes to you. So at 15, I heard that drum. At 16, I was on a flight and I, I'm continuing right now, and I feel as though it is my responsibility 
to to pass it down. I I, um, I try to get students to intently study so that they too can um, grasp the knowledge and continue to pass it down as well. Um, John Mason um, publicated Arena Risha, which is I use as a text for my class. So, you know, all of the components are there. All of the components are in place for you to uh, access. And so I feel as though it is my responsibility because I asked for it. <laughs> well, I want to, to interject uh, uh, pretty much about, about something that you say, like 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 inviting us to talk in this moment, uh, Mari. Uh, you were talking about the Africanized uh, spiritism, you no? Know? And then it's something that struck me uh, is like, yes, um, I, I would say, I, I, I would certainly agree that uh, the way in that uh, spiritism or mediumship is practiced uh, in, I don't know, coming out of cue, you know, because I think it's, this is one of the main branches that put all of us together in the panel somehow, uh, is certainly, a, 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 I don't know, it has a, a format that has come pretty much of, of a, a, it has a, a look that is very European you now, but at the core, this tradition is about the cult of our ancestors, different type of ancestors. We are, uh, you know, uh, adoring and calling and invoking constantly our divinized ancestors, our uh, the Odu Ifa, all the type of ancestors. We have the ancestors in our origin, the, our family ancestors too. You know, so everything in these traditions are our ancestors. It's about uh, creating uh, forms to harmonize ourselves with our ancestral community as well. You know, so I think this is the work, and it, and it can take different ways. And I, the way I see, like for example, the the intersection, uh, the, the the spiritism in this European form, as you presented, you now is is also a way in that we can kind of inquire our cultural intersections because none of us here, you know, all of us here have have mixed, you know, of different races, different ethnic groups, you know. So the way that I see also that uh, spiritism is a way in that we can inquire and acknowledge, you know, the fact that all of us are living in indigenous lands, for example, you know in Cuba, in the US, in Puerto Rico, you know, we are living in the Americas, we are living in indigenous lands, and we need to pay respect to those ancestors as well, even as African people that we are, even with our African traditions, but we need to acknowledge them because this is their land and those spirits are present right here. They want retribution and justice and we cannot look the other way we need our our work of for justice you know it cannot be only for ourselves it has to be for all the people that colonialism have run over you know in history and this is the way in that spiritism bring all these people together a lot of marginalized communities that when we think in the history of 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 romani people or gypsy people you know that is part of spiritism too you know that are kind of the the mediums and the and the performers, you know, the, the most important performers in the European traditions. Why would we call these people? Because they have a magic that is part of us. Okay. Whether we speak Spanish or we speak English or we speak different languages that are part of the European uh, tradition, you know, this is the way in the, So it's like, I, I just wanted to, to step in, you know, just not to, to take the opportunity to clarify that, yeah, Absolutely. it doesn't matter that it looks like European, but it's a way to acknowledge, you know, our cultural intersections, because we are in a cultural intersection, intersected place, you know, interpreted by different entities, different cultural influences, and all of them need a space, you know, if we mm -hmm. want to move forward, if we want to be successful, 
even in our uh, particular endeavors, you know, for social justice or for personal, you know, success. No, that's that's what I wanted to say. No, I love that. I mean, that's exactly why I uplifted, you know, your your sharing of that lineage because it's a lineage and, it, and it's actually, it's an, it's an inherently African worldview that allows us to go to a Misa and talk to El Congo, La Gitana, you know, all the commissions and all the spirits of all the ethnic sure. groups of the planet, of the planet, because it's the only place that we can talk to the whole planet, right? In a, in a, in a spiritual context. Um, so Marie, so I think, yes. No, no, finish your point, please. Yeah, no. So <laughs> like what, what I think, what I think this brings us to though is, uh, you know, on the point, cause Danise started to go somewhere and I want, I think it's really important. The center is a cultural institution um, rooted obviously in African tradition and justice for African people across the planet. Um, and, and so I want to, you know, when we talk about responsibility, we've touched a lot on the responsibility of transmission, right? And being carriers and bearers of tradition and bearers of culture. I think Danise started to touch on the question of responsibility within a religious context, okay, right? Okay. The center, the center gets a lot of questions and we have people in the chat and people in the audience who are maybe aleos or new to the traditions and don't necessarily understand the parameters of practice, right? Okay. And Danise was saying, Danise was saying, like, I'm a revolutionary, but there's certain things you have to respect, right? El fundamento se respeta. <laughs> <laughs> and no, so, when I say I'm a revolutionary, it's using the, I don't know how to say in English, la etimología de la palabra. Claro, no, 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 you claro. I mean? Yeah. Okay. So, but what, I'm, what I'm uplifting is that dijo como que el fundamento se respeta, right? A base mm -hmm. de lo que usted dijo. And so we, you know, we want to come to this question of responsibility. So I was raised in a household, you know, I have 20 years of old, but I was raised in a household of Puerto Rican um, spiritists and, and Santeros. My mother was initiated when I was 10 years old. My grandfather practiced the religion. And I remember as a child, you know, going to a tambor, a bembe, and like, okay, if you don't have Ocha crown, you don't stand in front of the drum, right? Mm -hmm. And, and then when you do stand in front of the drum, you stand in age order because the elders go first and then everybody behind them, right? And these are traditions that many of our people in our community understand and still honor and still uphold. And then there are, you know, there are these, and, and I think this is really important, particularly in the, when we have this discussion about what is happening at the intersection of art and performance versus religion and you know both Danisa and Jesenia I think this is a great question for both of you right um where people don't understand the line sometimes in the ritual context because they took the dance class at the folklore school so now they go to the religious uh ritual and think it's time to perform right but then <laughs> I, on, on the flip if we invert that equation on the other side of that and Baba Neil and Iyama as well who have performance experience as professional performing artists right the fact that you do have some freedom as performers and as artists to, to, you know, honor the aesthetics and also reinterpret things, right? And give things new shape and new form in, in an artistic uh, realm. So I like, I like y'all to talk a little bit about that. Um, and I also, before you answer, though, I want to invite the audience that's with us to start posting your questions in the chat because we're going to have the opportunity to actually answer some of your questions. So while y'all do that, I'm going to invite the panel into this discussion. All right, Marie. Please, oh, please, Mora, talk for, about Siete Mares. Please, Mora, before, talk about Siete Mares. You, I think this is the perfect moment for you to talk about it. Dale, go ahead. <laughs> after after the, the Baba. <laughs> okay, so before I must do this, because I've been getting hit in the head, um, and, <laughs> and, I have to, and I have to thank Denise, because there are some names that I must mention that I did not. Mm. And we're talking about ancestors, so I must mention these names. I must mention Aubrey Griffith because he is the doctor who first got me started on this path. I must mention the full name Chief James Hawthorne Bay. I must mention the name of Osa Unko. I must mention the name of Ishangi Raza. I must mention the name of Pancho Morta because he was the first Babalao who gave me my warriors. I must mention Julito Collazo, because wow. he was one of the teachers that he was one of the first drummers to come to New York with the true traditions 
and teach here in New York. I must mention the name of Orlando Puntilla Rios, my very dear friend, Ibaye to all of the names I'm mentioning because he was my dear friend and he was also one of my teachers and my mentors. I must mention the name of Charles Abramson, my godfather who initiated me, initiated me in Oshun. I must mention the name of Alfred Davis, who was my Ajibonakan Ibaye. I must mention the name of Renard Simmons, who was my Oriate and a teacher and a mentor. And I must mention the name of Ayaniyi, who was my, my godfather in Oyo when I was initiated in Ayan. So thank you for allowing me to mention those names because with all of this talk about ancestors and, and Denise did it and I was remiss and I had to, I had to correct that. Okay, I see, I see. activism, activism, people must understand that these traditions were intended to disappear. They were forbidden. They, the, the slave masters, the oppressors wanted these traditions to die. African people who were transmitted in an enslaved condition were not supposed to practice these traditions. And because of their tenacity and their ingenuity and their creativity and their resilience and their resourcefulness, we're sitting here on this panel talking about all of the years of all of the years of initiation and practice that is collectively among the members of this panel right now and how do we go forward and how do we guide so when we talk about what we what do we have to protect and what do we have to defend it has to do with that the activism comes from the fact in in cuba in Cuba, the traditions were established by pure Yoruba people, by pure Congo people who maintained their traditions as closely as they could to the way they practiced it at home. In Brazil, the traditions were established by pure Yoruba people, by pure Congo people. In the Dominican Republic, pure Yoruba people pure Congo people, in Trinidad and Tobago, pure Yoruba people, et cetera. Hey. The, 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 in Haiti, okay? The, the, the establishment of Orisha practices, Apollo practices in the United States was done by activists mm -hmm. because they recognized the healing qualities, the healing properties of people holding on and re their traditions in the face of the, the oppression that was going on here. People, pure Yoruba people and pure Congo people did not have the privilege and the opportunity to establish those traditions here on North America. What we're seeing today was initiated by activists because they realized the revolutionary act of embracing African traditions in spite of what went on. And I just wanna make one more point, And that is that our traditions are at once religious traditions, cultural traditions, and scientific traditions. Scientific physically and scientific metaphysically. So when we talk about the rules and the regulations, it is because there is a consciousness. There is a consciousness, a religious consciousness, a cultural consciousness, and a scientific consciousness. And that is the root of what the rules and regulations and protocols that we follow in ritual. I'm Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking us there. That was exactly where we needed to go. <laughs> yes. Can I say Nani, something? Absolutely. Okay. Well, um, I'm telling you, it's too much in the context that um, I'm going to start to feel so nervous. I don't know how I want to say, but I need to say, <laughs> I'm feeling so, so grateful, so blessed to be here in this panel because I can see the religion, the culture, and the academy together. 
working you know, together. I'm kind of the person that I don't like when the academy tried to colonize and be severe. I like when they mix. I like when they mix because everything has a value. Of course, we're talking about culture, about religion. Then we're talking about science. We are science as well. Okay. Yes, we are. <laughs> yes, we are. You know? Mm -hmm. And um, I tell you, I feel so emotional. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're perfect. You're good. Keep going. You're so good. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, I want to mention in you know, religion and art. I'm a religion. I'm a one body. How I can divide, you know. I'm only need to be responsible. I'm only need to have a conscious, you know, and I have to to bring my respect with this thing. We can maintain everything in place. I have an experience that people came to my class, and after the warming up, they told me I need to go because I don't, I don't be in this religion. I'm Catholic, and I need to stop my class, you know, to teach that person I don't teach religions because I respect my religion too much to bring outside of the context. Like I have to teach my students when they try to follow the pattern that they see on the religion platform when the people come in, you know, to the Anya and do what they need to do and they want to reproduce in class. If you want to create the habit to teach people what they have to do, you can do it. That is up to the people who want to do it. But that's, that needs to have a line on the staff because when the people go to the religion, those days, then the door is open for secret and alleged and everybody the understanding of many people can confuse and they can pass the line of the respect between religion and art. So that is also part of the responsibility that we as a, as a religion and as an artist. We need to place it, the student, what is the limit and what is the platform for art and what is for religion. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm a folkloric dancer and choreographer. So whatever production you're going to see from me will be about the Afro-Cuban folklore. And one of my, my, come say this, a premisa, my priority, you know, is preserve my culture. But we need to understand what we took for the religion, the essence that we took for the religion is the body. And does it not mean the body is not important in the religion? Of course it is. The body it is, you know, that is the instrument in any religion or in whatever we want to do it because we're human. So we take the essence, we take the movement, we take the music, we take the history or patakim, legend, whatever you want to call, to, con to building, to make a construction on the stage. That is the way that we have to acknowledge people about this culture that is important. But when you get at the point of the religion, we have a rule that we must to respect. We have a rule, we have an ethic. You don't have no ethic that you need to respect. And that is the more important, we need to carry with the religion. Yesenia Love uh, of Siete Maris, I know she coming to see, <laughs> she coming to see, you know, most of that, of the, my work, Siete Maris. Of course, you know, as uh, I made my research, I cannot do any work on my stage if I don't have a previous research deep it's not everything for me. I need to call the musician. I need to call the singer. I need to call the technology. I need to make my research to complement my idea because what I'm doing is an artistic recreation. In my position, whatever recreation I'm doing, I want to be as close as can be of the authentic culture, how it is. But that does not mean I bring my religion. Religion have a you know, a compliment that is only to be in their own platform. And that is something that we really need to acknowledge the people that are not related with our culture so they can understand art is art, religion is religion, and everything have one limit. Siete Maris is a word that I talk about Yemaya. Of course, I have to talk about Yemaya and about all of them because I love all of them. And I need to make my research. And one of the places, that I used to make my research at the Bembe. Mm -hmm. At the Bembe, the tambores. Mm -hmm. 
because I can see the movement. I can see the history. I can see so many elements. And when I bring to the stage, I bring a new information because not everybody have the opportunity to see or to experience, even the religion people. And sometimes I can be questioning for people because they say, I never see that. But it's because you never can see everything. The knowledge is for everybody. It's shared. Or beli gagao, beli lele. It's, it's, it's compartido. So you cannot know everything. You cannot see everything. And that's because I always try to ascend to say, that is good, that is bad. Everything have a value. We only need to see. And we always have to ask. And that's what I bring in seven marriage. I have to bring, you know, different aspects of this deity or orisha that many people know is very popular, but it's many things that people don't know. For those people that are alejo, as you say, or students that they don't know the culture or they don't come in original from the culture. And I bring this information to the stage. And I know people can feel, I believe, grateful. You see Yesenia with all the knowledge that she has, she likes the thing. And I know I need to grow up even more and fix it even more. I never satisfy for whatever thing I do because I think always can be better. But I know I give a tower of information for those people that are, are not part of this culture and they want to know because you cannot respect what you don't know. Exactly. Yeah. So that is because exactly. we from the state. That's what we have to stick on the state to tell people, hey, I'm here. Yes, I'm at six. Look at me. And that's it because I'm an activist. And when you say that, people think it is political. No, I'm fight to put my folklore in any platform for any dance discipline. Sure. Nobody have it more or less than me. That is because I'm feel I'm an activist because I need to put my folklore in every word. Yes, my folklore is traditional, but my folklore is also contemporary. Hmm. Sure. And that's my fight and my responsibility. <laughs> I want the people to talk because I can talk too much. Let me give that time. I just want to, to interject again to, to connect some, some interesting ideas that um, uh, Chief was uh, putting out there. And, and it's like this notion of the integrative knowledge. No? The integrative. I think, um, uh, yes. We, when we think in the ancient knowledge, the ancient knowledge was an integrative type of knowledge. It was not a knowledge that, like in the way that European, you know, uh, scientific way, you know, of thinking, you know, that this is like meteorology and, and history and and philosophy and everything is separate. You know, when we when we look at the body of knowledge of, of Ifa or, or any, of the oracles in our tradition, everything is absolutely integrated. Okay. And for me, it was amazing when I started like following like the, for example, like the letras del año that were coming out of the, out of the, the Miguel Ferrer Padron a group that was the first one that started doing like systematically like letras del año. Uh, it was very interesting for me because every year there was scientific discoveries you know, scientific discoveries, you know, that were coming out and were like completely new, you know, for people that is only in sync with the European type of, of knowledge, you know, or only, uh, it is only able to respect that type of knowledge. But when you look at the letter del año, you were like, oh my God, how can Ifa, you know, predict something that was discovering that people have no idea, you know? So yes, this knowledge is simultaneously, is history, is philosophy, is medicine, is all together, you know? It's a guidance for individual and collective peoples to get into a better life, you know? It's something that certainly, I don't think that uh, 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 the European way of thinking about a, a discipline, you know, can understand or can deal with what we are bringing. And at the same time, uh, thinking on the fact that all of us are artists and our approach and our path into the tradition, uh, I think art was a very important component of every single one of us to enter there. Well, there is a there is a question of, of aesthetics. And I when I 
I was uh, listening to La, La Mora talking about this, you know? Yes, every single time that every single one of us come out into a stage anywhere, you know, we are defending the, the aesthetic value of our tradition. And this is not a small thing because for we still are fighting the, the, the notion that black things are not pretty, that black things are not are not art, you know, that the art is like what white people do and what white people produce and what white people think, you know, and create as a as, as, as science, you know, and sell to us, you know, in a way that in a capitalistic way that we can consume, you know. So our traditions are simultaneously the things that heal us, the things that make us better. And these are also, there is a powerful beauty, unique beauty, you know, that is all together, you know, every single one of our rituals, our songs, our dancers, the colors, you know, every single one of the elements that makes so rich and powerful and unique this tradition because we are pretty much a code of nature we encode nature we encode the elements you know the the, the, the natural forces around us and this is something that makes us universal you know and cannot stop us and, and going back to what she was saying about the founders of these traditions that yes they were activists. But one thing that I always, I always think when thinking in the way that this tradition was preserved and legate and, 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 give, and come to us as a legacy of our ancestors, it's like every single one of those people want us to remember, want us to remember where we were coming from. You know, they put us in a, in a ritual form, our history, you know, for us, not only when I say us, I'm not talking about the Cubans. I'm talking about all the people in the African diaspora to remember, you know, where we're coming from. So this legacy is for everybody, not only for, I don't even think in racial terms about this tradition, and maybe some of you can disagree, but certainly for it's, it's a legacy for everybody in the African diaspora, for sure. That's I, I want to add a little bit something there. Many of the things that we experience right now is the convenience of the men. Sometimes we try to make guilt in the religion, the art, is, is us. Our, we as a human being, what is convenient for us and what is not. And that is what brings, you know, the, the divorce and many things. Because everything is beautiful and everything is mirrored in life. And I learned it like, when you know where you're coming from, you know who you are. And when you know who you are, you know where you're going. Sure. And I told my student in classes, don't change my movement. Because if you change my movement, you change my history. If you change my history, what I have in my hand, I need to maintain my history because that's who I am. And that's okay. important to preserve and to maintain. So that is my objective of class, more than the technique. Present the beauty, represent our root and traditional in any culture. I'm talking about for Cuban because that's my discipline, you know, and don't change. You can adapt many things. You can add to enrich and not change. And there's many things that can't be changed at all. And that is the point. Sorry, Baba. And, and that needs, no, 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 no. You have to finish your point. But I think it's important because even for myself in all of the years that I have, uh, this is more than 50 years that I have been considering the music and considering the drumming and considering the relationship between the drumming and the dance and considering the, the, the divine center of the songs and of the rhythms. There's a difference between the people who are practitioners and they bring it to the stage and people who are doing it only on the stage. And what happens is you see so many people, they want to play like this. Oh, let's play a Wawanko. Have you ever been to a rumba? Have you ever been to, have you ever watched the relationship 
not only watch, have you has you ever engaged in the relationship? The 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 psychic dialogue between the drum and the dance. When I hit that drum, that's physics. I'm sending those vibrations out. And when the dancer hears it, the dancer is feeling it. And it's a it's a it's a metaphysic, it's a physical and a metaphysical dialogue that's going on and there were so many iconic people that people want to get on the stage and they want to emulate what these people did but don't want to emulate who they are mm -hmm. who are these people what is the experience that they're talking about what is the history that they are narrating what is the culture that they are referencing? It's not just a dance. It's not just a dance movement. It's not just a rhythm. It's not just a rhythm. You know, it's not just parts in a rhythm. This is about a conversation, a cultural conversation, a spiritual conversation that goes back before anybody can count. Baba, Baba, uh, before I, I leave, I'm sorry to interrupt you. The problem is, or one of the problems is, people know the music and the movement, but don't know the culture. Then they don't know it. They don't know the culture. But they don't know, they, they, if they don't know the culture, then they don't know the music. No, no, they know the music because they can see. And any artist, so, even so, even so, empirical they can see the movement the song because it's not so uh, close like before it's a little bit more open today so they know the movement they know things and they also know a little bit more but they don't know the culture and they that's my culture. point that's okay. my point if you don't know the culture then you really don't know the music and that's if you culture. don't know the culture then you really don't know the dance that's it because you see so many things that, and I, and I want to, to touch here because as I tell, the line can be very fine and it's not divorce. I'm only talking on the concept, you know, like we need to place it because it's not divorce, because we're human, because we're religion, because we have a spirituality. And when the drum, as you say, you know, bring the sound, I hear. Yeah, my young listen, my young and everybody listen. We only need Voila. to be placing and know what we what we do and put everything on place. And as a religion, we know what we have to do, as well as an artist. Because it's not divorce, it's not divorce. I don't know if I can explain better. Yes. No, I don't know. You, and you can know. answer that uh, in that the performer and yeah, I cannot hear you. Uh, we have feedback if some of you have your, have your speaker on, maybe. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Okay, so the performer and the priest, it, it's really hard to separate the fact that you're now um, in performance mode. When you go on the stage, you are trying to manifest that energy. You are trying to, if you're a dancer, you're going to get on that stage and you're going to manifest the ocean how do you pull back from that you are manifesting rotations spinning and spinning and spinning within all of that you're bringing yamaja you are bringing oshun you're bringing oya you're bringing all of the deities that come through that rotation and with that you are bringing the spirit of your ancestors you are bringing the spirit of lineages of this tradition so when you uh, uh, come on stage and you hear the drum, the dance, the song, when I sing, I sing with every fiber in my body. I sing as though it is the last time I'm gonna sing. I sing till my kidneys are aching. I sing till my stomach is aching. I just give it all, I give it all. And so, through that, the audience, through that, the other musicians that are a part of it are there to execute what it is that you are trying to relate to the audience. And so in that, I've seen dancers who've gotten very caught up in the movement 
where Yemanja is on the way, Oshun is on the way, Shango is on the way, but as an artist, and now you on the stage, Carnegie Hall or wherever you may be, Lincoln Center, you have to have that control to, okay, let me, I'm here in a, with an audience. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna be able to get possessed on the stage, but you have to pull yourself back, but only to a degree. So, so as performers and as priests, um, coming and relaying and transmuting um, this message that you are trying to convey is, is, is a very powerful thing. And it's very hard to, to say, pull it back, to separate it from religion and uh, performance. Thank you so much, Iyama. And we're in the last five minutes of our discussion. So I want to, first of all, just kind of uplift a couple of really important core elements of what we've talked about, which is like that fundamentally the body, the African body, and the certainly anybody in an African tradition is a site of resistance, right? It's a site of healing. It's a site also of beauty and joy and creativity all the time right? Holistically, like that's who and what we are. Um, and we've talked a lot about, you know, again, lineage and tradition and ethics and, and responsibility. What I'd like to offer you all to kind of close us out is give us a word, give us your vision um, for what does the future look like? If as, as elders, as master teachers and artists, you know, what is the seed you want to plant for the next generations that, you know, native folks talk about building a world for the next seven generations. So if you were to plant your seed for the next seven generations in these traditions and in these practices, what is the seed that you're planting or would like planted? Continuity. Continuity in that it must continue. The tradition must be held with with great value and it must continue it must pass down to the uh the lineages under us and um of course giving thanks for the lineages above us and it is just a continuous circle uh, so i say cont uh, continuity thank you Yama. and justenia you just rejoined us the question to close us out is what is the seed that you want to plant for the future as a tradition bearer, as a, as a, a keeper? Okay, um, can I say something? Mm -hmm. Before I answer your word, I want to say before, I was agree with what he just said. But you need to make another program because I don't want to block the way. <laughs> I would like to talk a little bit more in the point that she mentioned it. You know what I mean? Because it's something there in a beautiful story. Okay, now, when <laughs> I, I, I like like a sign, I can apply one seed. So answer this question, I can I say only one word. I can All say- All the seeds you want, Danny. Todas las semillas que tú quieras. I can see continuity. I can see preservation. I can see conscious. You know, I can see respect. And I don't know how to say perseverancia. No sé perseverance, cómo perseverance. Okay, respect, continuity, you know, and of course, continue with the love. We need to preserve what we have it with love, con with continuation and perseverance. And I have a more seed, but I will leave something for Yesenia and Baba. <laughs> Thank you. Either of you, Yesenia, Baba Neil. Yesenia, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you go. I'm gonna finish it off. Okay, perfect. Um, I think my, my the most important seed for me is healing. I think um, healing has been at the core of our practices from the very beginning. I think uh, all these the people that incorporate this practice in the Americas uh, did it precisely to heal us for the trauma of 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 leaving our motherland. No into how to uh, to create new communities, new communities in the in the new land, new families, you know, the religious families were the new families, you know, that in that that allow people to integrate into survive, you know, into um, 
into our, our new existence. So I think uh, the healing is, is an aspect of the continuity of this practice. This is what we've been doing, what, what we have been doing for 200 years. We've been healing uh, ourselves, we've been healing the planet, we've been healing our communities. And I think uh, this is, this is uh, has been in our past, is our present and will be our future as well. Oshun's number is five. I have five seeds. Respect, appreciation, responsibility, vigilance, and love. Right. I think if we if we nurture those five seeds, the future will be will be good. Respect, appreciation, responsibility, vigilance, and love. Ashe. Thank you, Bob and Neil. We want to thank, I would like to thank on behalf of the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute, our beautiful panel, um, you know, Mayore Jimenore, all of you for your wisdom, for your love, for your creativity, um, and again, for being our tradition bearers and the people who help to ensure not only the uh, preservation of our culture, the resilience of our people, but also that beauty and joy continue to live on, right, as part of our resistance. So, Thank you so much for being with us. We want to thank our audiences, um, you know, on all of the platforms. We invite you to join us again on September the 9th. We will return and um, our next Sacred Traditions uh, edition, if you will, is going to be on mediumship. And we're going to be talking about different traditions of mediumship across the African diaspora, um, not just in the African traditional religious system. So we're hopefully going to be looking at the Black Church in the U.S. South. Um, as well as other traditions around the world in the diaspora. So thank y'all for being with us. Have a good night. Please visit us at cccadi.org for more information about our upcoming programs. And have a good evening. Be safe. Continue to protect yourselves and the people you love and your community. We are still in a pandemic. So we invite you to continue to care for yourselves and one another. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Odabo. Good night. Thank you all. Ayibobo. Hey, Shanikai. Hey, Shanikai.